Okay. Let's get started. So, uh, hello guys. Uh, this is my face. I have beard. Uh, not on my team's picture though. So, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. We're not seeing your faces, uh, but we're glad that there are so many of you. Uh, we are super happy to present you uh, and to share this event with audience spreading from different uh, corners of Bulgaria, Macedonia, Serbia, and all the way to the Transylvanian region in Romania. And while you might immediately associate Transylvania with some bloody well-known characters, uh, this meeting today will be hosted by two agile uh, evangelists and practitioners. Well, we all know that, uh, you know, there are no vampires, besides Dracula, but hey. So uh, today's journey, uh, we'll go on a sci-fi journey into the neuroscience and brain functions. Uh, we have uh, great speakers for you. Uh, you've heard them already. Uh, they tried to make some jokes. Some of them worked. Uh, we have Nikola Bogdanov. He's an agile coach and senior project manager uh, at Dava. Hey, Nikola, are you here? Yeah, hi, hi. You there? Great. And we have also Catalin Balascuta, who is an agile trainer and project manager from Endava uh, in our office in Brasov, uh, Romania, actually. Hello, uh, everyone. Okay, we have Catalin as well. Uh, okay, then uh, the floor the floor is yours, guys. Can you? So now you you show my face, right? I show your face. Okay, cool. So hi everyone. Hi Van. Hi Catalin. Let's move on to the topic itself. So it's going to be very geeky, interesting brain stuff. But uh, I think that the most logical question is what exactly is the relation between agility and neuroscience? Why we talk about this? And Catalina, I'm going to ask you something and you tell me if it's true or false. I'm going to say something that I've heard many times. Imagine that you're just born and you have a normal brain like everyone else and it starts forming, growing with the years and till the age of 25, your brain is on 100%. You have some billions and billions of neurons and neurocells and you're just brilliant at this moment. You know, you, everything works for you. Recently, recently what they say is that your brain stops growing and uh, with the time you're producing less and less neurons and uh, you're losing neurons at the end of the day. And with, with the time, it turns out that uh, your life quality is affected. So do you think it's a true or false statement? Um, Nicola, I think it's false. And I'm not saying that because I'm not 25 anymore. <laughs> it turns out that many things we knew about the brain are wrong. Um, studies from the last 15 years uh, show that our yeah. brain is fully capable to grow new neural cells. The only difference is that we can increase or decrease this process called neurogenesis uh, via our own actions. So it turns out that our brain is agile, talking about agility. Uh, and if we build the right environment and follow the right principles, it can grow. Uh, just like we want uh, with our teams and organizations. Uh, before discovering more about uh, our brains, let's look uh, at the agenda first. So obviously we will talk a lot about neuroscience, biology and psychology, but we want to make it useful and practical. So we decided to associate what we scientifically explain to real events and situations. Um, to achieve this, let's imagine we are going to run a retrospective. Of course, you will notice that uh, this content can be related to many other situations or ceremonies, but for simplicity, we will cover the retrospective case. We will have a Q&A session, uh, so please use the Q&A section for submitting your questions. You already did that, so you know how it works. Um, we will be answering uh, at the end of uh, the session and make sure you don't fall asleep because we have a quiz with prizes, so stay tuned. So Nicola, you're a Scrum Master and you want to organize the next retrospective with your team. How can the science help you prepare? Let's, let's take a look at first at how our brain looks like and what are the main parts of it. So from uh, time perspective, the oldest part of our brain is the so-called reptilian or lizard brain. It's responsible for our instincts, for 
biological functions like eating, uh, swallowing, digesting, and so on. It's it's what we have been what what of thousands of millions of years ago. With the time, we have developed another brain part, which is called the limbic system. It's a set set of uh, brain parts, which are mainly responsible for the decisions that we make. And that means for the emotions. They are all our emotions like threat, reward, happiness. It's coming from the limbic system. It's our emotional brain. The um, important part here is that, that these two brains are very strong and they work all the time almost in 100%. The latest and new, actually the newest brain that we have is the so-called prefrontal cortex. It's the logical one. It's the one that is going to rationalize what our limbic system wants. Because the limbic system, it's like a bank of uh, experiences. And with the time, you're collecting experiences and you relate uh, emotions to them. So when something happens, you, you connect to this emotion and uh, it drives your, your reactions, your uh, decisions and so on. So imagine that your limbics, you have some, I'm sure you have, seen, you, have uh, you can imagine about people that are very annoying and imagine that in this moment your limbic system says, okay, punch him in the face. Hopefully uh, the prefrontal frontal cortex will work and uh, you won't do it. Uh, and this is how you are rationalizing what you're doing. The opposite is not really possible. That means that if we don't want something, if we don't feel emotionally connected to something, doesn't matter how logical it is, it will not work. For example, doesn't matter how logical and rational it is for us to eat only vegetables. <laughs> we obviously, most of us don't do it. Uh, besides that, we know that we need it's better for us. And uh, another characteristic is that this prefrontal cortex uh, gets it needs lots of energy and it gets empty very fast. We can say that we do not more than 10-15% of uh, our day-to-day -day decisions using the prefrontal cortex. Everything else is just emotions and, uh, and instincts and just some uh, automatic behaviors. So, if, if there is one thing that uh, you need to take as a takeaway from this session, let it this be the one. So we are all emotional beasts. We are purely driven by emotions. That's why when we go to a retrospective, we need to make sure that whatever we bring on the table as topic, as problem, as something to be solved, it should be something that the teams, the team is related, emotionally related to. In other words, if you bring something to the team that they don't recognize as important, you just have uh, all the awful retrospectives like uh, resistance and uh, aggression and uh, rejection of the retrospective and so on. And Catalin, let me let me see actually uh, how how do we know what topic is relevant for the team in the retro? What do you think? Well, the simple answer is observe and listen. Observe what happens during the sprint so you can understand the context. And this is the data, data collection phase. And listen to your team members to get valuable insights about uh, what they think and how they think and how they feel. Uh, you can find out a lot about uh, a team by only listening. During the sprint and also during the retro, just sit there uh, in a corner and listen. You will get a lot of useful information. Um, there are three levels of listening. The higher the level, the better the information that you can extract. So the first level, it's called internal listening or listening to speak. It's the chat zone, as you can see here on the slide. Uh, most of us uh, are in this state and are uh, we remain here unless we are uh, intentional about developing our listening skills. At this level, we are uh, only uh, listening uh, when uh, others talk, uh, but in our mind, uh, we have... Um, uh, other thoughts. So we're not focusing on what they are uh, saying. We talk about, we think about uh, our problems. We think about uh, giving them a, uh, an answer or a solution uh, to, to their, to their problem. And uh, this is the lowest level of listening and pretty much it just comes naturally. Um, 
it has uh, the most potential to create misunderstandings and often causes uh, us to miss key information in conversation. So let me give you an example to, uh, to demonstrate. Um, a team member uh, says to you, I would like to suggest to keep the dailies in uh, the 15 minutes time frame. And uh, immediately you go, yeah, I noticed your dailies are taking more than 15 minutes. According to the Scrum rules, that's not good. What's wrong with you people? Uh, most likely this conversation will end up in a, in a conflict. Um, and for sure it will not solve the, the problem. Uh, level two is called focus listening or listen to hear. Most of us can get here in uh, selected situations if we are motivated. At this level, we are actively paying attention to what the other person is saying. Uh, we are not thinking uh, about what we want to say next. We are totally focused on the other person. If we truly want to become great listeners, we have to motivate ourselves to listen internally to every person. To give you the same example, team member comes to you and say, I would like to suggest to keep the dailies in the 15 minutes time frame. And you say, uh, how important is this for you? Why do you think this happens? So you provoke your colleague to tell you more and you, by this you explore the situation. Level three, it's called global listening or listen to understand. Uh, it's a, a mixture of focused listening, uh, but you are in the same time aware of the whole environment and your own intuition. Um, it's the highest level of listening and uh, few of us can get there without uh, intentional practice. The rest of us have to work hard to get there, but it's doable. At this level, we are not only paying attention to uh, what the others are saying, but we also um, are paying attention to their energy level, to their gestures, to their body language, to the environment and to our own uh, intuition. Um, so to continue with the same example, a team member says, I would like to suggest to keep the dailies in the 15 minutes time frame. Maybe you see their, their um, um, voices um, very low or they are doing gestures like this. They are very, um, uh, unsure or very anxious uh, and then you ask I understand your team is going through some difficulties how are you doing with the other ceremonies um, it, your intuition tells you that there is more uh, to it than just the daily scrum which is not uh, keeping the 15 minute slot so uh, you 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 make a step back uh, and you ask about uh, the other ceremonies trying to to have a complete picture of, uh, of it so uh, now that the preparation is done, let's have a look at the retrospective flow. A good retrospective is like a good story. It should have a, a flow, a storyline, and our storyline goes like this. Uh, first, we set the stage. Uh, here is where we set the foundation and where we use the icebreaker activities. You will hear about uh, this later on. Then we gather the data. In this phase, we collect information and there are specific activities to be used here. For example, the sailboat activity that I will detail uh, later on. Then we generate insights where we analyze the data, uh, filter and prioritize it. And then we decide what to do. Uh, in this phase, we take decisions and define action items and then we wrap up. Uh, here is where we summarize uh, what we have agreed on and we end the retrospective. In the next minutes, we will uh, take them one by one and explain what is happening from the neuroscience perspective. So, Nicola, how do we set the stage? How the brain can help us build the right foundations for the good retrospective? In order to understand how our brain can help us, let's take a look at the smallest part of our brain, the neuro cell or the neuron. Uh, it, let me show you how it works and what are the key elements of the neuron. So at first on the, here, these branches, these are the dendrites. They're responsible for receiving and catching signals from other neural cells. We have the nucleus, which is the brain of the cell and the axon, which is like a gun. So pat, 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 you're just sending signals to another, to other uh, neurons through the axon. And we also have the axon terminals. This is where the signals are sent to the other uh, to the other cells, they can be different signals, making the, the cells and your the whole brain doing different different things. Let's see closer. If we have 
two neurons that which are communicating, exchanging messages between each other. They stay very close to each other, almost touching themselves, but not really. There is a small gap between them called the synaptic gap. And this is where these messages are transformed from electric signals into chemicals. So based on the different types of signals, we generate the, the left hand side cell generate some uh, specific chemicals and send them to the other cell, which receives them and so on and so forth. These chemicals are called hormones and neurotransmitters. They are very important because they pretty much dictate our thoughts, our motivation, our ability to learn and concentrate, so very important stuff. And actually exactly this stuff we want to address in the set the stage in the beginning. Let's start with the bad guys. So we have cortisol and adrenaline. These are in general the stress hormones. We don't want this in our meetings, in our retrospective. So let's see how they work. Um, as I said, they are the bad guys, but actually they are good. What I mean uh, is that when there is a threat, we release cortisol and adrenaline, which is shutting down our prefrontal cortex. So we stop thinking and we become fully instinct and emotional driven. That means that we have been left with only three options, fight, flight or freeze. And this is, for example, when we meet a tiger in the wood, in the woods, so basically hope we don't meet, but if we meet a tiger in the woods, we don't want to really ask our brain, okay, give me the 10 ways of dealing with tigers. You just need to run. And this is what happens. The problem is that uh, our brain does not really recognize uh, the tiger in the wood and uh, a stressful situation at work. In both cases, it will release cortisol, which is going to make uh, the team and the people in it uh, defensive uh, and uh, not cooperative. It even there is another bigger problem that if it's released too long for too long time, basically you get to depressions, uh, insomnia, um, different kinds of physical, really physical problems. Ho luckily, we have oxytocin. This is another hormone called the cuddle hormone. It's uh, the antagonist of uh, cortisol. What does it mean is that when we increase the oxy oxy oxytocin levels, they are decreasing the cortisol levels. And it's called cuddle hormone because actually it's released when we hug someone, when we feel empathy. Um, for example, when we do different socializing activities in our retrospective, it will increase. Uh, the oxytocin level. You can feel the oxytocin, for example, when you're looking at uh, cute animals uh, through the internet or babies or when you're thinking about your nice childhood. So all kinds of social cool memories, they can increase the, uh, the release of oxytocin. And this is what makes the team more generous, more humble, more empathic, and they can bond to the topic or to the person which is in this discussion. One example of retrospective technique that you can have for the beginning, for the set the stage, uh, is uh, one icebreaker. This is where we want to set the initial mood of the, of the session. It's called candy love. I'm suppose I'm pretty much sure that many, many know about it, but I'll tell you it's very simple. We just need a package of Skittles or M&M uh, candies. So we offer the, every one of the team to pick a candy and they don't watch, they're with uh, closed eyes. So depending on the color that they are picking, they can share, for example, you can decide um, what's your favorite meal, where you want to go, you like to go for vacations and this kind of socializing stuff. Even for more serious topics, let's say we have a product owner and we have uh, to help him with something and we need to discuss this problem. Uh, don't go directly to the problem. Start discussing from the empathic side of the uh, problem. So ask the team to think about how, how actually uh, the product owner struggles. What are his or her difficulties and what can we do actually in order to help? Even invite the product owner in the session. This will also increase the social element. Okay, next one is my favorite one. Let me show you how it works with one, one video. Uh, just a second to load. 
here it is. You celebrate Dingus Day. The quirky little rituals include boys sprinkling girls that they fancy with water, and the girls striking back with a tap from a pussy willow branch. <laughs> I'm not gonna let you do this on this. All right. Okay, so at this moment, this guy's brain is full of endorphins. It's uh, released when we have fun, when we are laughing, when there are jokes, fun and humor. Uh, for example, you can add a color from the candy candy wolf. Let's say if you pick green, tell us the most ridiculous thing that you have done in your at school, for example. So share some funny and uh, uh, jokes and this kind of things. In incorporate jokes in the in fun in the beginning in the icebreakers, and this will help us uh, become more creative, uh, to be more relaxed, focused, less critical, and accepting. So very cool stuff. The next one is called serotonin. It's uh, responsible for our mood control. It makes us more positive and open. It's released when we feel pride, when we feel significant. And this happens when we just celebrate our successes, when we discuss our wins. For example, you can also discuss hero stories and you can think what are the hero stories here? But actually here they are. Yesterday in a retrospective, I had this real hero story. We discussed how one of our team members who is backend developer, developer spent lots of time and effort on helping the QAs in the testing phase. So she was recognized and uh, that, that all was discussed. And actually, this is when the serotonin level goes up because we discuss what good we have done. We have another tradition after big releases to have a chocolate cake in the retrospective, for example. It's really important to celebrate success. The another two ones which are going to cover in details a bit later are called noradrenaline and acetylcholine. With noradrenaline, we become more alertive, we feel challenged, and acetylcholine helps us uh, increase our memory and to focus. The most important neurotransmitter and hormone is both is called dopamine. Uh, this is the one that is responsible for the most important stuff, for focus, for motivation, for fun. It's called the reward hormone. And uh, you can feel it, for example, when you just badly want to see the next episode of the series that, uh, that you're watching. This is the, the dopamine. The problem is that our brain is addicted to dopamine. We want more and more, just like a drug. And nowadays, our brains are used to get dopamine everywhere. That's why if we lose the focus and if we lose the dopamine and don't produce dopamine in the retrospective, your people will start immediately looking around. Their brains are going to start looking for mobiles, for uh, Facebook apps and messengers. And how can we solve this is when we introduce dopamine in the retrospective. This can happen via different, different techniques. For example, round robin table. So everyone waits for his turn in order to do something, say something, answer something. So this waiting for your turn is uh, increasing dopamine. Working in pairs or small groups on specific topic is another way you can do it. Very powerful techniques are visualization and um, storytelling. We are going to cover them a bit later, but they're very strong 
in terms of dopamine release and one hint at sugar or candies or sweets in your retrospectives. I can tell you that I have seen the difference that it makes in the team when they know that they are sweets during the retrospective. It turns out that the sugar increases significantly uh, the uh, dopamine levels and the release of dopamine goes to the highest levels. So, a summary, we have all these hormones and neurotransmitters that we want and uh, the set the stage is the phase and the moment where we can actually set the, the mood stage. So this is, this is what is uh, super crucial for us to choose which one we want to address. And after we set the stage, Katalin, tell us how can we actually brainstorm? How, how, how to get in the brainstorming part? Okay, so the retrospective, it's a good opportunity for us to learn because uh, during brainstorming, a uh, part of what we do is, is learning. So uh, we learn about us, about our behaviors, about uh, our team and our ways of working. So we will talk a bit about learning. When we learn something, uh, our brain actually changes. It's restructuring, it's changing the inner structure, and this is called neuroplasticity. Um, what happens is that for every new learning, uh, neurons are grouped and form chains of thousands of neurons as you can see on the next uh, slide. Practicing makes the chain stronger. It makes the neurons group and connect to each other. And um, when you face a problem that you need to solve, especially if, if it's something you did before, your brain reaches to the corresponding chain, picks it up, and without even realizing it, bam, you know what to do. During sleep, after the practice, is where the learning happens. So here is when the restructuring is happening. Uh, postsynaptic uh, post dendritic spines are created during sleep and the information is transferred from the short-term memory into the long-term memory. That's why we want short uh, learn sleep cycles and not just long hours of learning like we did uh, before an exam when we were students. I'm sure all of us did that at some point. Um, so that's why we want to focus on a single uh, or a small amount of issues in every retrospective. And that's why we want short retrospectives frequently at the end of each sprint, preferably, instead of one large retrospective every two or three months. Um, some team events consider uh, multiple, some teams consider multiple, running multiple mini retrospectives during the sprint. Um, but this is something you'll need to, you'll need to choose based on your uh, team situation and your uh, your context. Uh, similar effects to sleeping uh, are obtained by meditation and cardio training, but this doesn't mean that uh, you have to skip sleep. Uh, we all need a good night's sleep. So we, a few suggestions. Um, uh, one is to schedule the retrospectives in the morning. If possible, uh, include moving exercises in the retrospective. Uh, and this will help increasing the oxygen uh, level in the blood and uh, getting a burst of dopamine. For example, uh, each member go to the whiteboard and post cards uh, or um, uh, do retros while standing up. Uh, throw a ball to a colleague and ask them to ask him or her to pass the ball to the colleagues. Dance or do some movements in a specific order when you hear a certain word. Um, have smaller retros. Uh, and um, make them uh, every few days if it's necessary, if you have a difficult situation like a stressful deadline or an ambitious commitment or something like that. So let's see what happens when we sleep because I've mentioned sleep a few times. During the day, our brain gets full of chemicals which get toxic with time. So something needs to happen to uh, wash them from our brain. And this is uh, what happens during sleep. The brain is... Um, of, uh, is programmed to function like this during sleep. It's uh, washing up all the toxic chemicals inside it and replenish the neurochemicals uh, that you need for the next day. Um, consider having retrospectives in the morning. Your brain will be better prepared for that. And that's uh, the reason uh, why, because the brain it's, uh, should be clean of all the toxic chemicals uh, accumulated from the previous day. Um, we will uh, uh, 
we will talk now about visualization and storytelling because Nicola mentioned uh, these are two powerful techniques. So there is a study that shows that when something someone is telling a story, the listener's brain uh, waves are becoming like the storyteller's brain waves. So they start to be on the same uh, frequency. That's why storytelling is so powerful. And if we also add visualization to it, we can activate our mirror neurons, which are responsible for empathy. So our team uh, will be immersed into the story and the team members will be more open to, to dialogue. As an example, let's have a look at the sailboat retrospective technique, which uh, uh, Nicola and myself used uh, several times in, uh, in our, with our teams. Um, it goes like this. Uh, you draw a sailboat or you ask one of your team members to draw a sailboat or you show a picture because if you're working online, it's, uh, it's more difficult with drawing. Uh, you show a picture of a sailboat like you can see here. Uh, then you put your team's name on the, on the boat and you uh, tell them, imagine you are in the sailboat and uh, you have some winds which are uh, uh, blowing your sails and it makes you move forward and you also have some anchors that are slowing you down or even stopping you. And then uh, you ask the team to think at the last sprint and write down which are uh, their winds and their anchors. In a few minutes you'll have quite a list of topics uh, to think about for sure. And since I've mentioned thinking, Nicola, can you tell us a bit more about the way we think? Yeah, of course. So we currently learned how to learn and how are we creating learnings and knowledge. But let's see how actually we use it. We use the knowledge. So we have in general two ways of thinking, focused and diffuse thinking. The focused thinking is when we're trying to reach something that already exists in our brain. So we try to pick the right chain of knowledge, so we pick it up and voila, we can solve the problem. Usually we are addressing some specific places in our brain where these neurons are, uh, are collected and uh, where this chain of knowledge about this topic uh, exists. The problem comes that if you are trying to solve complex problem that you don't have solution about, you don't have a prepared chain to pick, then if you try to just focus, let's say I'll tell you, okay, now focus, think focusly in 20 minutes about new ideas. I mean, this is not really going to work. What we want to have there is the diffuse thinking. It's combining different uh, pieces of information, different, different parts of our brain. And how we can do the uh, diffuse thinking, it's very easy. It's when you stop thinking. That means that when you're discussing the topic, if you see that it's a really complex one, just stop, have a rest, go have a walk or sleep or go to the gym. During this time in the background, your brain is going to process what you have come up with and you can get some new uh, impressive ideas. Very interesting is that actually Salvador Dali was using the diffuse thinking. Imagine that he was uh, when he needs he needed uh, new ideas or uh, uh, some some sort of uh, inspiration. Um, what he was doing? Imagine this: he was sitting calmly in his uh, uh, summer house. It's warm. Some some uh, birds are singing, and he has a couple of a cup of, cup of uh, wine in his hand, so he's drinking for. It's, it's little by little and he the, the only thing that it's uh, strange is that he is holding a chain of keys some keys in the, his other hand and he's almost getting asleep and one once he just fell asleep the keys are dropped and this noise is waking him up so he picks the sheet next to him and start writing down all the ideas and thoughts that uh, come to his in his mind in this problem at this moment. So it's a really cool way to use in intensively your diffuse, diffuse thinking. Um, something that it's also important to be mentioned is that our brain is not really uh, capable of doing both in the same time. You do either focused or diffused. That's why we split the brainstorming part in gather data where we do more diffuse thinking, so come with ideas and uh, Analyze, uh, generate insights where we analyze what we have done. Um, let's look also from one other angle. 
our brain uh, produces brain waves. I'm sure everyone knows about it. And depending on what our brain does, there are different brain waves that we can detect. For example, we have the alpha brain waves, which are very calm and uh, our brain produces them pretty much when we're sleeping, meditating, relaxing or something like that. Uh, the beta brain waves are a little bit more intense. This is when we are awake, when we're thinking about something, when we feel excitement, when we talk to someone next to the coffee machine, when even if we do some regular um, job and task and so on. But the one that is very, very uh, interesting for us is the gamma waves. Uh, these are waves which our brain produces when it's working hard, when it's learning, when you're creative, when um, you're solving complex problem and when you do this cognitive processing. So having this in mind, let's see how we should solve different uh, problems or how we can make different decisions. If it's a simple thing, let's say uh, we need to write our uh, some document or thesis for school or something like that, homework. So what we need to do is to sit, focus, then have some rest, focus, have some rest, focus. All the Pomodoro techniques are going to be very successful here. On the other hand side, we have complex problems. And the complex problems are being solved when we load the data, then we have some rest. As this is where we actually have this diffuse thinking and this background, then background thinking. Then we sit down after some time, and very shortly, intensively, we, we solve the problem. So this is how we do the, the, the complex problems. Another cool thing or maybe important thing is to understand that you have also different people. So in your team, you can have linear thinkers and diffuse thinkers. Linear thinkers are those, those that uh, do linear tasks in the Pomodoro way and complex tasks in the complex way, in the diffused way. But they are also diffuse thinkers. Myself, for example, I am diffuse thinker. We are pretty much incapable, or it's very difficult for us to do even linear tasks in, in uh, the linear way. So we do even the linear tasks in the diffused way. So you can think, let's say, imagine that uh, I have to write a report or uh, a document. So I'm doing some work, then I'm just skipping uh, and starting changing the topic, working on different stuff. From time to time, I'm thinking about it, like, okay, I, what I will do with this thing, what I cannot, but just like at the last moment, I sit down and do the job. Usually these people do the job very fast and with high quality. The only problem is that maybe they can could look uh, lazy or uh, procrastinating. Actually, this is how their brain works. So we should be aware of this. And even being aware of our people, we still get to conflicts. Katalin, why, why is this uh, so? Um, to understand why conflicts happen, we have to understand that uh, people infer and react on specific events, sayings or happening. Uh, these are the triggers that uh, are driving us to do certain things that later on we, can, uh, we cannot uh, explain ourselves why we did that. So each one of us has different triggers and um, to understand what's the relationship between uh, an event, an emotion caused by the event and an action, we will use a model called the ladder of inference. Uh, to, um, to give you an example, to understand it better, um, a while ago I was walking on a boulevard here in Brasov. Uh, it was close to a crowded bus station um, where I saw a, an old man making ample gestures with his hands and running after a young man on a scooter. So Nicola, what do you think happened there? The, I don't know, maybe he has stolen something and he's running away. That's exactly what I thought too. Uh, and probably that's what uh, other people thought as well. Since someone from the bus station stopped to the young man uh, on a scooter, I got closer because my dopamine level uh, increased. <laughs> I was <laughs> curious to see what is going on. And surprise, the young guy dropped his wallet and the old man was running after him to return it. So do you see how our mind involuntarily rushes to, to climb the ladder and uh, based on past experiences or beliefs, we jump into conclusions. 
Um, basically, what happens is that we have a, uh, a pool of uh, observable data. It's the reality around us. Then we make observations. Uh, we look around uh, and we see uh, some things. We uh, then uh, select uh, some things uh, from the ones that we see and uh, give them meanings. Uh, then we make assumptions based on our experience and our, uh, our past uh, uh, encounters with a similar situation. And then we drive a conclusion and we create beliefs based on that. And then uh, we take actions. If uh, this is uh, this ladder is climbed without uh, make, uh, making uh, use of our uh, prefrontal cortex judging uh, the situation, uh, we end up in a situation where we teleport ourselves from the bottom of the ladder to the top immediately without uh, uh, climbing it step by step. So literally we are jumping to conclusions. Sometimes we might be right, but sometimes we are wrong and uh, we uh, most definitely uh, can end up in, uh, in conflict. So uh, this is uh, a way to understand better how we can get to a conflictual state. Next, I will show you another model, which is uh, useful to understand what happens in a conflictual situation when we deal with, uh, with an angry person. Um, this is the hand model of the brain. It was created by Dr. Daniel Siegel. And basically, it uh, explains uh, the components of the brain by using the hand. And as you can see uh, here, uh, I have my, my hand. We can imagine this part is the spinal cord. Then uh, we have the brain stem over here and the limbic system. It's my, my thumb like this. And then uh, the prefrontal cortex, which uh, comes on top. And if we look from the profile, it's uh, similar to how our brain looks. Um, so uh, when we are under stress, when cortisol and adrenaline uh, have been released in our blood, what happens? Uh, the following thing happens. We flip our lid. So our brains gets from this state to this state, metaphorically speaking. Uh, so cortex gets for a while um, offline, if you want. It gets uh, disconnected and reasoning with a person who's in that state with uh, his or her lid flipped, it doesn't work because when we are in that state, we cannot... Um, process logical arguments. We are driven by our limbic system and uh, our uh, brainstem, which are emotional, which are uh, instinctual. So we are not capable of uh, using our prefrontal cortex for uh, uh, reasoning. So this is a situation that uh, you can encounter in, in a retrospective or in a, in a meeting which is uh, um, very, uh, where you have a difficult conversation. In this case, uh, what uh, is recommended is to wait until the person uh, comes down and then have the discussion based on logical arguments. Uh, either you stop the meeting there, you stop the retrospective and you do a follow-up the next day. Uh, either you take a, a break and you go for a walk with, uh, with that person, you talk about what happened and uh, they are maybe calm down or you can help them calm down by, by talking to them. Or you do an empathy exercise like, okay, now let's share how we all feel and, and so on. So if you experience this situation, it makes no sense to continue um, uh, the conversation based on logical arguments because you will not get anywhere and the conflict will only increase because the person, uh, if the lid is flipped and you, you keep pushing that person, it will only get uh, make it worse. So since we talked about stress, Nicola, there's a myth that uh, we said we want to get busted this evening. Uh, and it's something I've heard and I'm sure you've heard as well and probably uh, also uh, our audience uh, heard it, um, especially from managers. We need to push our people in order to motivate them. Uh, can you tell us why this is wrong? Yeah, 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 yeah. So listen carefully because there will be questions in the quiz and at, at the end. And don't forget to write questions uh, because we're 
uh, in the final state of uh, the presentation. So uh, I have also met such guys, uh, usually managers and usually guys, who think that um, we need to push the team, we need to stress him so, so the team is uh, focused and works. Even I've seen people who are intentionally giving the team shorter deadlines than the real one so they can be more uh, focused and uh, pushed and stressed and so a little bit of push can help them and so on and so forth. Let me show you how the performance of the brain goes depending on the level of the arousal or the push in the brain. In the under arousal state, so when we are here in the beginning, we have uh, pretty much low performance and this is when we do regular job, maybe we do something, uh, some talking to someone and so on. On the other side is the over arousal. This is exactly where you will go if you stress the team, if you do firefighting, if you uh, use the retrospective for uh, blaming game, if you're trying to see how wrong we are or all kinds of things. So this reducing the deadlines in order to uh, focus the guys, actually you're killing their productivity. And what is the result is usually depressions, burnout, uh, all kinds of real physical problems can, can uh, happen here. Where we want to be is the so-called flow or the zone. This is where we are so focused in the topic, in the task, in the job that we are doing, that we just lose, lose uh, sense of the time. We don't know, okay, when, when did this one hour went away? And this is where we want to go. And here we need these two guys, the noradrenaline, this is the one that is responsible for the challenge. So this is the one that is released and making us more focused and uh, motivated. Uh, this is when there is a challenge. So we need to make difference between challenge and stress. So stressing the team is not going to work. Challenging the team, so asking them to stretch, to, to do a little bit more, to, to jump a little bit higher. This is what we want to do. And this is not via, okay? And the second one is again dopamine. We definitely need the focus and the fun in the retrospective or whatever we're doing. And acetylcholine, this is the focus. This is released when we are working on a single thing and we have enough time in order to focus. That's why in retrospectives we want to address one thing at a time. Even if there are bigger problems, you want to have one problem in the retrospective for the whole retrospective. We don't want to uh, refocus guys, refocus the, the, the team that we're working, working with. Okay, so it looks simple. Okay, fun, challenge, focus, and we will have all the team, the whole team in the zone. Here again, we can have different people, which makes the thing a little bit more complex. We can have people who are a little bit more on the left. That means that these are people that get stressed very easily. This can be someone who is stressed uh, and freaking out about the deadline three months before it. We can have also the good thing with, this, with these people is that they, they get very fast into the arousal. Uh, on the other hand side, we can have the so-called dopamine junkies. People who are looking for challenges for things to do. This can be someone who is, I am sure you know such people that is traveling to Tokyo in the weekend, then he's coming back, uh, doing some rock climbing and running marathons and in the next day helping uh, children in uh, some something like that. So these are the people. These are usually entrepreneurs, uh, this kind of uh, really brave people. Uh, you can say that uh, these ones on the left hand side should be, I don't know, dedicated to some boring administrative job, but you will be wrong. Actually, it turns out that mm, here you can find the most um, Nobel Prize winners. And why is this so? Because here you can find people like doctors who are 
curing uh, the same uh, disease for different people every day. They don't get demotivated. Then don't don't try. Okay, let me try to heal this time another another way of uh, of uh, healing. So we have here scientists who are running the same experiment over and over again for years in order to get results. So here it is, and here here is what you need to know in order to. Uh, work with the stress and put the team into the flow. Finally, we are going to discuss uh, together the two last stages of our retrospective. This is decide what to do stage, where we decide what to do, and wrapping up is where we summarize and so on. The rule is that when you are in the um, decide what to do phase, to think about one and only one single action item for the team for the next retrospective. You don't, uh, our brain is totally incapable of multitasking. If you try to multitask, pretty much you're going to focus, then refocus, then focus, then refocus, and you'll never get to the flow. So we need one action item. Of course, if you have multiple action items because there are some many small stuff that needs to be done, make sure that uh, you have not more than one per person and still also make sure that there is one which is called the main action item for the spread. And you focus the team that this is the main action item that the team needs to do in the next sprint. Wrapping up or closing the session or summarizing what we have done, what have we decided, what are the decisions and so on is also super important. Don't forget. Usually we forget about this. We don't wrap up. We don't summarize. But actually, what happens is that our brain is very strong in terms of long term memory. It can store gigabytes of data. But when we talk about the working memory, it looks like it's very poor. There are studies that show that you can have not more than seven pieces of information in your in your working memory at once. So what we need to do is to at the end to focus the people to summarize. OK. This is what we decided. This is the main action item. Uh, this is uh, the plan who is going to do what and how and so forth. So let's wrap up also our session today. And how are we going to wrap, wrap it up? Via quiz. So we're going to ask you different questions which are going to summarize uh, what we have spoken about. And there will be some prizes. Ivan, what are the prizes? Uh, hello. Yep, I'm still here. Uh, we've prepared uh, three vouchers for for Amazon for our winners. Uh, so yeah, uh, if we, you guys are able to join the quiz with your emails, that would be great. Uh, you can use your names as well, and we'll try to reach out and uh, talk to you about how to get your uh, rewards. Okay, let me reshare my screen so you can see my browser. Uh, just a sec. Here is my browser. OK, can you put it live? Yes. So there is some delay because these Teams events are streaming, so I will be a little bit slower uh, when I'm pressing the stuff. So everyone have in mind that you're hearing what I'm saying in about 15 seconds uh, delay. So please, everyone, scan this code. And uh, Either scan it or uh, enter the passcode opening the slido.com or slide.li. Uh, slide.do. But yeah, you can just open this link, then uh, enter the code or just scan the QR code. And you'll get to our quiz where we want you to write your full name so we can understand that we can know who is winning the game. Uh, the first three of you will get the prize. So please, uh, I'll give you some time. I'm still talking because of this delay and <laughs> to not stay uh, in awkward silent, uh, silence. But yeah, so everyone, I'll give you uh, some time.
Okay. We have almost 70 people. Let's wait more. And let's see what we have learned. There will be five questions. Uh, you have 20 seconds for every question. So also have in mind that the faster you are, uh, the better you will be uh, scored at the end. So we need five fast but right answers. Okay. I still see people joining and joining, so let's wait a bit more. I see some people with only one name, so if you win at the end, make sure that you contact us. Otherwise, we will take the price for us <laughs> because we will not be able to find it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, whoever wins the top three, please uh, contact us, send us some email or a note or something like that so we can uh, see who gets the prize. There's two more people. OK, so watch carefully in um, in your devices, because as I said, when I say something, you hear it in 15, 20 seconds. So once I start uh, the questions, I will stop talking. So you need to just uh, watch uh, the question and answer, but uh, watch it in the in your apps, not on the screen because there will be a delay. OK, I think we uh, more people are joining. <laughs> I think that's great. We have time. Yeah, sure. And then we'll have the questions. So yeah, we, we have some questions yeah, and we have a very good save question. Save some time. Uh, you remember that you need to delete the of the course, of course. The the difficult ones, yes. <laughs> okay. 142. Okay, let's see for the next 10 seconds no one joins. I will move forward. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 nine, ten. Okay, starting the quiz. So everyone, take a look in your uh, screens, in your uh, mobile phones or browsers if you have opened it with a browser because we are starting. Yay, let's see the correct answer. You 92% have answered correctly. As you remember, the neuroplasticity, if you're doing the right stuff, which means practice, sleep, uh, running, jo jogging, this kind of things, your brain and also the food, if you're eating healthy stuff, your brain is totally capable of uh, creating new, new brain cells. So let's see what we have in the next question. Actually, first we'll see the leaderboard, I think. I think we're going to have really close race here. You uh, want? There are more questions, oh. so let's see. OK, let's see. So we're moving to the second question.
OK, so did you remember? Some of you have, so the correct answer is emotionally. So all our decisions, so this is the key takeaway from this section. Please remember this, are driven by emotions. If you want to buy, that's why you're buying a uh, more expensive car than the one that is having not so exciting brand or all kinds of other stuff. So but then your neighbor. Yeah, yeah, as we said, our profound, our logical brain can stop us from doing something emotional, but not the opposite. Doesn't matter how rational and logical something is. If we don't want it, if our feelings are rejecting it, it will not going to work. Let's see what we have in the leaders board. OK. Yana is still in the lead. Moving to the third question. This is maybe a little bit more difficult. OK, most of you have answered. Correctly, yes, dopamine, the most important of all uh, neurotransmitters and hormones. It's really uh, what we receive when we're focused and when we see, when we sense reward. So next one is to see the leaders board. OK, let's move to the fourth. Nobody answered the manager. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'm surprised. OK, cool. So 91% this was very, very easy one. Let's see the leaders board. OK, so let's see the final, the last one. It's more difficult one. Have in mind that yeah, this is uh, a little bit more challenging question let's see if you're going to answer correctly one two three go OK, let's see the right answer. It's at your work desk. If you remember this diffuse thinking, actually, uh, if you're on your desk and just working, 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 you'll never come with really great ideas. And maybe you can think about where your really good ideas came from and maybe I'm pretty sure you can find similar or such or one of these that are causing it. But it turns out that for focused thinking and focused working, your desk is a good place, but not for ideas. So take a walk, go to the gym or in the forest or in somewhere, uh, it will be much better. OK, so let's see now who's the winners. One, two, three, go. So the first three ones are Erika, E, Bogoy, and New Keegan. So congratulations, congratulations. You are the winners, and uh, you receive you will get the prize, which, as I said, uh, is what was the what was it vouchers for Amazon? Vouchers for Amazon, yeah. So we'll try to uh, reach out, guys, and hunt you down. OK, so yeah, write, uh, write the, your emails, your uh, names or something like that, that we can recognize you, contact us, 
Everyone else, good job. Sorry about Maria and uh, I don't see for, because of this. Uh, Andrea. Andrea, yeah, sorry about it. Uh, you are very close, but also very far. <laughs> okay, I'm going back to the uh, presentation and we can actually share, stop sharing and let's go to the question part, right? So yeah. you can show our faces only. Sure, let's do that. Okay. Let me see if I can um, show both of your faces. Try. OK, we don't have that option. Maybe you can try and choose to answer to different questions and we can do it like that. Yeah, let's yeah, try. Let's see. Okay. Are you going to ask the questions? Uh, I can read it out loud if you like and yeah. we can answer. So I can try to read the questions with the most votes that we have. Uh, let's see now. We have very good questions. So on the topic of retrospective icebreakers, a nice example with candies, but uh, many of us are working from home. What could work instead? Can I answer? Uh, yeah, answer and uh, then uh, I okay. can also so add something. What was what was the purpose of the candy love? We said that it can it can be used for uh, oxytocin, which is to use it for different socializing stuff. You can think about online uh, ways of running online socializing uh, questions. You can actually it's not about the eating. So you can just have the Skittles or the M&M and you and you can just uh, pick one one candy for everyone or you can ask the team. It will be also very interesting if they don't know this game. Tell them, you know what? We're going to do very funny game and very cool one in the next retro. So go buy some M&Ms. Everyone needs to have one. So you will actually increase the dopamine in this case. OK. Good. Something something else that uh, you can do, uh, for example, is ask uh, your colleagues to draw something and then share it uh, with the camera. It's it's possible and the drawing uh, it uh, sets you up for uh, creative thinking. So it's it's a good icebreaker if you do that. Yeah, and the, the other thing that we mentioned was that you can use it for adding uh, color for something very funny. I'm pretty sure you can think about other ways to introduce humor and fun. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Uh, next question. It's uh, it's from a manager actually. Uh, it says the following: As a manager, uh, how to find the zone for every one of the team members? Everyone uh, has different stress level and functions differently yeah. under pressure. I got the. I, I was about to mention this, but I forgot about it. So thank you for the question. Uh, it was something that I was thinking to say, but I didn't. So there are bunch of exercises for recognizing uh, different people's characters. For example, uh, 16 personalities, most of you have heard about it. So all kinds of such activities that can help us explore uh, what we do, what we feel, uh, how we react in different situations can help us actually understand better our team members. Of course, what Catalin said in the beginning to actively listen and understand what you're seeing is also something that will help you to read your people. And uh, um, yeah, this is this is what uh, what I would do. So different exercises for exploring people. One another example besides the 16 personalities is uh, Jürgen Hapel. He has uh, one game called uh, Moving Motivators. There are 10 motivators and everyone from the team, you have to print them or ask them to have them at, uh, if it's online, so it can be done as well. And they have to arrange them from uh, the left to the right uh, ordered by priority. So if for, they are like, uh, let's say autonomy, mastery, purpose, all these kind of things and you arrange them uh, in, in order to show which is more important for you. So we arrange them on the left hand side are the more important and they're sorted uh, so we can see uh, for, for the different team members which which uh, actually motivators are really working. And this, there is also a second uh, part of this exercise 
where, but yeah, let's not go there. But here, this is very useful in order to uh, understand your team. But what is important here and uh, what uh, I would like also to highlight is that uh, if you're a manager, it's very um, good uh, and uh, useful to spend time and uh, know your team. So invest time into knowing your team members, listening to them, knowing what their uh, motivation and their uh, triggers are. So then you can uh, adjust. So all these activities that Nicola mentioned before and so on are the, the purpose is to know them. So there is no silver bullet that, okay, if you do this, your team will uh, have uh, 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 overnight uh, very good results but you'll have to know them and um, uh, then um, try to to adjust according to their personalities okay uh, do we go to the next question yeah uh, I think we have one that sounds interesting so it says can you elaborate on the neuroscience of the brains of a team that are overcommitted work in excessive hours etc what might be happening in their brains and what are the side effects? If they are uh, providing very good results, um, something is happening in their brains. Uh, what will happen? So they, there are all sorts of chemicals. Maybe uh, they are high on dopamine because uh, they have a challenge and they see everything as a challenge and uh, they want to, to reach it. Uh, maybe they are afraid that they will lose, lose their jobs and in this case they have cortisol which is uh, pushing them. Um, uh, what will happen no matter what what is in their brains is that at some point their bodies will, uh, will uh, stop functioning correctly and probably uh, at least in my experience you will see medical leaves and um, all sorts of uh, things happening if this situation is carried over a uh, number of months or even years, but usually after uh, uh, more than three, six months, this starts to, you can see the effects. So it's good if you, if you have such a team and if they are delivering on one or two sprints or three sprints, they are pushing to uh, have a successful release. But more than that, there will be side effects and the side effects will be on, uh, on the people's head especially and then the motivation and everything that uh, is related to that. I agree also that uh, it can be different causes that are causing uh, this overcommitment. Uh, maybe they did something good. It's like uh, they're trying to put stretched objectives, so stretched goals. They're trying to do more than they usually do. Maybe they are afraid. That's why they do it. Maybe they are uh, scared and so on. Maybe they just don't know what they're doing. So there could be many, many reasons about it. And uh, what you need to do is to understand what's the real reason in this case, because again, it could be different things that are happening in uh, their brain. And uh, one thing that I would do is to run some sort of empathy exercise. Like uh, when we explained what we do when we are under stress. So we need to involve as much as possible our prefrontal cortex. So the logical part and how we do it. There is a technique called effective labeling, which means that you're trying as a team. You, you make this as an exercise in the retrospective, for example. You're trying to analyze how do we feel? What do we feel? And what's the name of the feeling that we have when we're doing this? So you need to put this question on the table and start elaborating on what the, the team feels and uh, what's the, their in, inner reasons of overcommitting. And when, when, when they start label, that's why it's called effective labeling, they, when they start putting labels like, OK, we do this because of this feeling, uh, actually their logical brain starts working and you you may you may uh, get out of the stressful situation or make it more easier for you to understand um, what what to do. Okay. okay. Next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on managing people at different levels of knowledge while working on the same project, especially in the time when we work from home? 
motivating them and using the best of each and every one of them seems impossible. Really? <laughs> Catalin, do you want to answer? Or I, I, I can go if you want. I will, uh, I will try. Um, okay, go on. It, it, uh, it depends on several factors. Uh, normally, if there is an agile team, uh, and uh, they are self-organized, uh, it's somehow in, um, in their responsibility to work together uh, to reach the goal. Um, it might be that the ones which have more uh, experience to take uh, one or two juniors, so to say, and mentor them and keep a close contact uh, and uh, make sure they, are, uh, they have what they need, they have the, the skills and so on. Uh, as a manager, uh, maybe you can uh, see wh where the gaps are and you can uh, offer them some trainings or uh, you can, uh, um, um, I don't know, uh, suggest some, uh, some kind of uh, uh, job rotation if they don't feel they are in the a, in a right place. Nicola, you wanted to add? Yeah, um, so what I'm thinking about this here is that actually it should, in theory at least, it should be good that you have different, uh, how, how was this, it said, different knowledge levels in the team, right? Did that, that was the word. Yes, different levels of knowledge. So, in theory, this should be something good because this means that you have balanced team. You have teams of senior people that can uh, exercise their leading skills. You have more junior people who are actually uh, liking, uh, they like what uh, the leaders are doing, they want to learn more. So having this balance team is actually something very healthy. I've seen teams of superstars that are total fail. You can think about any football or soccer or sports team with uh, superstars that is losing the game. So having only superstars in the team is not guaranteeing at all that you're going to actually uh, have a good team. Uh, the brain part here is that, huh, let me, this is interesting, so I'll spend some uh, two more minutes on this. Uh, I'm sure every one of you knows about uh, Maslow's pyramid. And what is on the bottom of it, the bottom two uh, levels, are uh, physical needs, then security, so to feel safe. And after that, we have social, socializing, social elements. And this theory says that uh, you need uh, security and um, uh, safety, and then you can do social elements. It turns out that this theory is totally wrong from neuroscience perspective. Actually, we have survived socializing in the years, in, in the past. Just because we have been gathered together as groups, as families, as prides, made us able to live and to, 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 to get here where we are. And if we are actually, if you think about the films that you have seen, one of the biggest, maybe the biggest after death punishment for uh, people that needs to be punished is to bring them out of the society, right? To, bring, bring, to kick them off. So this is very strong. And where I'm going here is that you need to know that actually, Actually, this pyramid is wrong and the social part is on the bottom. You need to work a lot on the socializing element. And uh, one very cool uh, way to do it is to use another pyramid. So look about it uh, in uh, Google. It's called five dysfunctions of a team. I'll not go into the details. It's uh, created by um, Patrick, Lencioni. Patrick Lencioni. Yes. Uh, so, five dysfunctions of a team. There is also a novel, so he wrote a novel, but the whole concept is uh, which are the main five dysfunctions. And again, in a pyramid manner, so we need to start with the lower one, removing the lower dysfunction, then the next one, the next one. And for example, the lower one is uh, lack, lack of uh, vulnerability in the team. So it's you want to make the team actually start sharing the people in your team, start sharing uh, where are their weaknesses, what they cannot do well. And these exercises in retrospective can actually help you. 
Okay, sorry for the long answer. I really like this uh, this theory. Okay, we have one uh, short question. I hope we get a short answer as well. Uh, <laughs> how do we overcome a dopamine addiction like phone or food addiction? Who would like to to go for it? Okay, Catalina, I think it's your your turn. Um, if I would have a solution for that, I would write a book. <laughs> um, willpower helps. So uh, if you uh, if you realize that you have this addiction, it's a it's a good step that uh, you know it and you're aware of it, and then um, try to I don't know uh, stay away from it or compensate with uh, something uh, some other healthy activity like I don't know exercise or do something else instead of uh, picking up your phone, uh, go for a walk, uh, or uh, try to to close it uh, at uh, I don't know five o'clock in the afternoon or seven o'clock in the afternoon so that you're not tempted to uh, to search on it. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of the modern uh, problems that we're all facing this uh, this addiction. And uh, according to some uh, studies and documentaries, it's by design. So uh, I don't want to get into into this, but that's actually a very complex question. What, what, exactly. what I would say uh, is that um, this is something that we need to accept. We cannot fight with it. You cannot. We are totally addicted to dopamine and our brain is used to receiving dopamine from all kinds of devices, TV, uh, books, uh, chats with friends. So. We are like we are not, we are like junkies, you know. We are addicted to it, and we want to get it. And whoever gives us the most, the biggest, and the strongest dose of dopamine is the one who wins. Uh, and as I said, if if you have the case in the retrospective, you can use some techniques like, as I said, round robin table. So one after the other, everyone is answering. So we wait for your turn. You cannot just start looking in your phone if you know that your turn is coming every second. Uh, another thing is to make the people work in small groups. When you're working with another person and you're discussing something, you cannot start checking your phone. Um, another thing, let me let me tell you something. The biggest problem is with the, I don't know what's the name of the newest millennials, uh, the, the newest generation. So after millennials, Z. Uh, Z, whatever. So with them, we have the biggest problem. So they are, since they are birth uh, addicted to dopamine resources everywhere. But still, the other day uh, I went to a nice coffee shop uh, in the morning in the center of the city. And what I saw is that bunch of kids were sitting on the ground. No, none of them was actually looking in its uh, phone and they were listening a person reading from a book some very interesting story. So storytelling is something that it's much, much more powerful if you can do it. So take a little bit time into dig into the, let's say, the art of storytelling, because giving the right stories and really involving the team to get into the story can help them. Uh, get the dopamine level so they don't look for them in in uh, in the mobile phone. Okay, cool. Um, do you guys maybe saw a question that you think it's interesting and you would like to answer? Um, for example, <laughs> I see this one. Do you have a question? Nick? No, I just saw one. We look at funny cats gift gift gift. <laughs> This is yeah. for releasing uh, oxytocin, yeah. I think that works. Okay, uh, another question. How can we engage uh, guy, guys which are very, very closed, not willing to open themselves, not wanting to talk or to become friendly and just saying, I just want to do my job. All the other things are personal. I, I just want to do my job. <laughs> I, I can try. Yeah, it's so basically, it's how to engage a typical programmer. That's the question. 
I think just, so, yeah. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, well, um, it depends. There are uh, there are uh, people who act uh, and uh, who are doing a very good job if they are left alone. Of course, uh, you cannot isolate them totally, but. Um, what you can do, and I've did, uh, I've done this, uh, this before, is to respect their uh, their way of being. So you cannot uh, transform such a person overnight, or and it's not necessarily um, okay to try to do that. Um, you have to agree on a level of uh, involvement. Okay, uh, I understand you don't want to dance uh, in the office uh, together with us, but uh, let's see what are you willing to do. Maybe uh, start with uh, small things and uh, then they, uh, they will open up, uh, like share what's your favorite color or something like this, which is not harmful. Uh, if if you're pushing uh, such a, a person to to open up, uh, and if it's surrounded by people who are very open and uh, um, uh, um, expansive and communicative and so on, uh, the risk is that they will uh, uh, close even more, and uh, probably at some point they will leave. So try to try to take it uh, slow, and uh, don't forget to respect how they are and their way of being. Not all of us are super expansive and communicative and, and so on. So Yeah, Katarina, I, I really agree with you that uh, on one hand, uh, we should really see if this is a problem. Because in many cases, it's just that this person is doing a very good job and he's more closed, but it's just that he's more introvert and so on. Uh, so we need to understand if there is a problem at all. Uh, uh, one way to do it is again these 16 personalities, uh, some personality assessments and so on, so you can understand better what your uh, people are uh, feeling and what how their motivation is driven. Because you need to address, as we said, their emotional brain, their limbic system. If you want someone to do something, doesn't matter if it's close person that you want to share and so to change something in their behavior. We need to address their emotions. So we need to find out what is the thing that really I really care about. Let's say I care about I don't I'm a little bit close person, but I care much about code quality. I, I really care about the quality of my work. I'm a craftsman. What I do, I really try to be detailed and every detail to be perfect. So if you want to make this person open, then address this topic, address something like, OK, how can we uh, help others to have better code and blah, blah, blah. How you can uh, work uh, in, in a broader audience, in, not only in your own code in order to address this stuff. So find out what is the thing that the person is emotionally connected to and try using it in order to um, to achieve what what the change that you want. Uh, uh, if I come to you and tell you, let's try Scrum. It's super cool uh, because if we do it and you're a team member or you're a team, uh, this is super cool. Let's try let's try Scrum Scrum and uh, we're going to win five times five times more money as a company. Most of the people will just take a look and tell you, you know what? I don't really care because my salary. It's not going to be changed or something like that. Uh, what I'm doing now is to do some coding. You want me to change my way of working, so I need to get used to the nuance. But I'm still going to do coding. So why I should care about your scrum and your revenue and so on? But if you go to the team and tell them, you know, let's try this scrum thing because I saw that your biggest pain in the last five months was that uh, we discussed it several times. The um, managers and stakeholders are coming and bombarding you with requests and uh, you just are getting crazy. Let's try this thing Scrum and it will give you two weeks where no one is going to be supposed or allowed to reach you, right? OK. Uh, one of the questions that has like a lot of votes is uh, from Cosmina. Do you have any advice on how to manage the two categories of team members? Those that quickly react to stress versus 
dopamine seekers. And do you have any insights on how these categories match to risk aversion slash preference? Just uh, just act act uh, uh, uniquely for everyone. I mean, don't one size fits all does not work at all in the whole agile area. Uh, the the modern medicine is uh, focused in uh, personalization, so you need to find personal approach for everyone. That's why we have small teams, not teams of 50 people. And if you have small teams, uh, you can actually have a unique approach that is suitable for everyone. And if you have dopamine junkies, uh, excitement seekers, you can give them more challenges, more challenging stuff. If you have uh, the, the people on the left hand side who are getting stressed very often, give them to do something important, but uh, without a deadline, something that they need to do like every day, a little, a little, a little by little in order to get to the end goal. Yeah. OK. Uh, what books, articles uh, do you recommend about neuroscience slash agile brain? Well, one recommendation from my side would be to uh, watch uh, Dr. Friederike Fabricius. I think I, I hope I spelled it right. Uh, it, uh, she has a lot of uh, videos on YouTube. Uh, very, very, very good. Uh, another recommendation would be uh, Dan Siegel. Uh, which uh, invented this hand brain model and he has uh, also a series of books. Nicola, you want to add? Uh, I will add a couple of names in the chat, in the Q&A section. So give me just a few seconds and I'll write a couple of names there. Great. So next question. My colleagues are some pretty serious guys and they don't get involved in these type of games. What can I do to help them open to these activities? Take it uh, slow. <laughs> so if they don't fancy playing games, um, there are lots of activities that, that you can do, which uh, are not uh, as playful as Nicola described with uh, candies and all sorts of stuff. So uh, for example, um, try um, uh, asking them to draw something like I mentioned previously or ask them to uh, describe how the sprint went in one word or uh, try to uh, uh, ask them to share their favorite uh, song or what's their favorite book or movie or so. These are things which are not uh, that uh, uh, playful or intrusive that uh, somebody who's very serious would say, no, no, that's not for me. I don't want to do that. So try uh, other types of activities uh, that uh, they can resonate resonate with. And from my experience, it works. So if uh, if you're sharing or if you're making the team's play playlist, for example, as an icebreaker and everyone shares their favorite uh, song, um, I don't uh, I don't think somebody will uh, will refuse this because they are too serious. Uh, maybe they have a, uh, now going to the listening part. Maybe they have a problem with uh, being in the team or they have uh, other sorts of problem that needs to be uh, inspected. Why they don't want to uh, participate to these activities. Maybe they don't like uh, the, their colleagues or they don't like the approach or um, Otherwise, uh, there are, and uh, I can recommend uh, it's uh, Retromat. Uh, if you Google it, I think you will find it, and you find there are lots of uh, ideas for uh, uh, this kind of activities, more or less playful. Okay, my answer uh, to this is that okay, you have more serious people. That's not that's not a problem. Uh, maybe you will not be able to do the candy love with them. Maybe they they don't like this kind of games. But you should ask yourself what you're trying to achieve. Let's say let's just keep to the topic, but let's say you want to increase the oxytocin, so to be more bonded to some topic. Uh, add it in a story. That means that when you go to the retrospective, you don't ask them, okay, what went well, what went wrong. Ask them something like that. Imagine that this problem suddenly, like we sleep in the night and we wake up in the morning and this problem somehow 
is gone by magic. Some magic happens and this problem is no more existing. What would you feel then? Uh, what would be different for you? I mean, if you look around and see that this problem is somehow magically disappeared. What you will see around? What, how you feel yourself? What will be your day in this moment? What you feel? Who is, are you going to talk to? What are you going to start doing the first? So asking, putting them in this kind of story can make them actually, again, you can tweak the story if you want a little bit more fun. So endorphins add some jokes in the story. If you want uh, um, serotonin, add a little bit more hero stories. So put them into the position to discuss their achievements and so on, what have, have been, every one of them has done. So that's it. And you can still get uh, the right chemicals produced. Um, so how to deal more efficiently with distractions? <laughs> Avoid multitasking. Avoid multitasking, yes. And as we said, distractions are good when we do the diffuse thinking. So have in mind that if you are solving a complex problem, you need to do some thinking, let's say brainstorm for half an hour the topic and then distract yourself, do different stuff, go out, uh, work on something else. And uh, you see that uh, in the background, your brain is going to, to learn some things. Or if you're doing focused thinking, use Pomodoro techniques. So check, check Pomodoro. It's a Spanish word meaning tomato. And it's a technique that uh, yeah, you need to, to, to add it to your day to day life. It's not going to uh, work by itself, but this technique is that you need to um, to split your working day into, I think, 25, if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, minute sessions. So you run 25 minutes of focused working. In this time, you're shutting up all the all the distractions. Usually, 25 minutes is enough if someone reaches you to to be able to wait for you. So after the, these 25 minutes uh, are over, you can answer your emails and do some small things for, let's say, 5-10 minutes, then jump into the next sprint or Pomodoro. OK, Katalin, would you like to add something or that was enough? It was enough. OK, great. Next question. Uh, in the beginning of the stream, you said for neurogenesis to happen, environment must be correct. What do you mean by correct environment? Yeah, I think the term was the right environment, but uh, I uh, I get uh, the question. Uh, it was something mentioned during the presentation. Uh, let's uh, first let me mention that uh, neurogenesis, like all other processes, are uh, are deeply connected to each individual. So for each of us, uh, some factors can influence more than others. Um, as a general answer, try to live a healthy life. Uh, exercise, sleep well, uh, uh, be careful with what you're eating. Uh, there are studies and uh, there are there are still in progress, uh, studies in progress that are showing different connections. So for example, if you're eating, if you're having a, a low, uh, fa uh, high fat diet, it will affect at some point uh, your brain and the neurogenesis. If, uh, if you're eating too much sugar, it can, um, it can do the same if you're not exercising uh, and uh, you're um, I don't know living in a very polluted city that uh, that too might affect the way your body uh, responds to to this so a healthy lifestyle can help it also depends on on your condition and how your uh, body works what other um, um, diseases or uh, things you, you might have um, that are affecting this. I just pasted one person uh, and even one talk. It's it's in Google. So yeah, you can uh, understand that this person is not uh, like a random guy on the street. 
and he's talking a lot about this. And uh, according to his studies, um, the neurogenesis uh, can be achieved and can be done to the whole of the, pretty much in the whole of your life. And you need pretty much not more than three or four things, which is healthy food. Foods that can be very helpful are blueberries and uh, omega-3 stuff. So all kinds of salmon things are super important for uh, increasing uh, your brain's um, way of generating uh, neuros, new neuro cells. Look about neurogenesis, neurogenesis as a term at whole, as a whole and something how, how can we affect it. Uh, the second thing is uh, Catalin said is the exercising and here the most uh, um, useful one are all the cardio trainings. When we start doing more cardio like running, jogging, whatever, cycling, swimming, uh, we actually make uh, the blood uh, go fast to our brain, which is helping us uh, pretty much generate new dendritic uh, spines and so on. So our brain cells can connect to each other and uh, be better. Uh, another thing is the good sleep. It's also very important. And all this, they are related to uh, the reduced levels of stress. So the stress is also the other uh, thing that is uh, going to uh, make the things worse. Uh, and of course, the opposite, unhealthy uh, behaviors should be avoided because you can actually make the things worse. So uh, eating junk, it's not going to help. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Irina. Will you do a follow-up session that might include some neuroplasticity activities applied in agile practices? I really like your approach approach for this session. We just the previous question I think answered uh, pretty much this one because neuroplasticity is exactly when we are exercising, sleeping, having rest, uh, reduced levels of stress, healthy food. So, yeah, you can eat blueberries in your retrospectives. Yeah, the question still was if we uh, to do a follow up session uh, oh. on, on that topic. And yeah. yeah, it's a good idea. We'll have to think yeah. about it. Stay tuned then for, for the sequel, right? Uh, let's increase some dopamine. So, uh, we know the answer. We will not share it with you yet. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Actually, we have already decided how to do it, but we won't tell you now. <laughs> follow us and follow uh, follow Endava on social we, media. We, follow we Nicola, you, follow me. We will tell you next Monday, so uh, keep a track in our uh, LinkedIn page. Subscribe <laughs> right, then. Okay, another question. Uh, did you guys go to a psychology college or where did you learn this kind of stuff? I didn't <laughs> go to any point. <laughs> there is lots of information everywhere. You need just to look for it and to spend some time. Uh, I personally just uh, what I'm doing is I have some topics in mind. Let's say uh, neurogenesis or uh, neuroscience. And uh, when I go to the gym, I'm just launching some video or podcast and I'm listening to it then the next one, the next one. And uh, if you start looking for such uh, resources, let's say if you go to the gym five times, five, five times a week and you're able to watch one or two videos every time, you'll be there. Aren't you supposed to do exercise while you're at the gym? Yeah, with the headset, <laughs> I mean, with the headset. But uh, yeah, you can just stay in the gym. Uh, usually there is a coffee place there, so. Uh, so you stay in the coffee place then? <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, how I started was from um, from experience. So I I met situations where uh, I had to deal with people with their little flip and uh, and so on. And I I wanted to to find out more about this behavior and stuff. And this uh, drove me to to uh, to search for answers. And I discovered uh, nice articles, links, and so on. And this is how it uh, started. Mm -hmm. And okay. once you start, it's 
It's simple. We have nine more minutes. Uh, are you going to pick, let's say, final question or? Uh, sure. I'm trying for uh, a question which is, you know, difficult and challenging. Do, do you see such? Uh, hmm. So, OK, we have one. Uh, I think it sounds fancy to me at least. Isn't uh, neurogenesis uh, valid for every human being indifferent of the environment? Can you repeat it? Sorry. Yes, I can see it sounds fancy. Uh, OK, isn't neurogenesis valid for every human being indifferent of the environment? I think we answered this question. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's for everyone, but if the environment is wrong, uh, it will be shut. It will be just not happening. It's a process that needs to happen in the brain. OK, I see one. Uh, it's so basically you cannot get in conflict if both parts are using the, the their prefrontal cortex. <laughs> what do you think about this one? It would be it would be very good to to be true. Um, of course, you can get uh, into conflict uh, even if uh, if the prefrontal cortex is working. Uh, the only difference is that when your lid is flipped, so prefrontal cortex is deactivated, you cannot reason with uh, with such a person because it's uh, driven by the limbic system and the, the emotions and the the fight, flight, freeze um, um, instinct. So yes, you can get into conflict, but you have higher chances to um, to minimize it or to to solve the conflict by. Uh, uh, reason uh, by reasoning by providing uh, uh, arguments and having a, a conversation uh, rather than uh, getting uh, into a conflict with uh, one or two persons which uh, are totally acting uh, under uh, uh, the uh, pressure of their emotions yeah so my answer is that partially it's like that i mean um, if both of the people are using their prefrontal cortex, maybe it, they will not get to this conflicts. Uh, but as we said that it's working for about 10% of uh, our time and most of the things to remember about the ladder of uh, inference and so on are just happening. So uh, in general, yes but also in general have in mind that uh, conflicts can happen everywhere uh, and sometimes even the conflict can be the logical thing to happen so in this case um, your prefrontal cortex can ask you to go and i don't know punch someone in the face if it's logical uh, the thing is that i want to uh, to reverse to, to change the direction of the question a little bit uh, because, yeah, there are lots of stuff about conflict management and blah, blah, blah. But what I am usually missing in these trainings, let's say, for conflict management, is one of these five dysfunctions, which is the lack of conflict. Actually, it's not okay if you are having some kind of artificial harmony in your team and there are no conflicts. You want to have healthy conflict. Actually, every argument about do we need to use this technology or that pattern or something else, it's a healthy conflict, of course, if we use our prefrontal cortex more. So fo focus on, on these ones and check again these five dysfunctions. They can help you actually have better team and not have the bad conflicts that much. OK. OK, do we have time for a final question? Very fast one, maybe. Last one. Uh, it's a long question. What do you think is the optimal mode for a team to work to obtain the best results and to keep the level of happiness high across the board? Is Scrum the holy grail? Is something else a more natural approach? I'm wondering if sometimes the resistance to Scrum or similar process is because of lack of knowledge or there is natural opposition of the brain. I forget half of the question. But yeah, uh, that question has a lot of questions. I, for I can say that uh, the first part of the question that I heard that the fun and the right mood are actually 
uh, together. I mean, you need to have fun in order to be high performing. You, you saw this thing with the zone. To be in the zone or in the flow, you need to have challenge, fun and focus. Uh, so regarding the other, the second part uh, with the scrum and so on, think about again how you're addressing uh, this scrum. Are you addressing something that they are emotionally connected, positive, 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 positively to or not? For sure, Scrum is not the holy grail, but uh, no other approach is. So nobody found the holy grail of uh, uh, project management approaches or methodologies or however you want to call them. Um, what I would uh, suggest is try. So if you have a team and you want to have uh, uh, to see them happy and uh, motivated and uh, to get results, because in the end that's what we all want to get the best results from our teams, uh, try. Try to see what's best for them. There are a lot of uh, things that you can apply. Uh, Scrum is one of them. There are others as well. So try to see what makes them uh, resonate. We don't have a silver bullet solution that we can offer you. I have one, but I won't tell you. <laughs> it will be the next episode. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank Two you. hours is not a small amount of time. So thank you for your patience. And uh, I cannot see you, but uh, I'm very delighted. Thank you also from, from my side. Uh, we really enjoyed your, uh, your uh, questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, looking forward for uh, next time, whenever that will be. Uh, as as I mentioned before, uh, keep following uh, Endava on social media. Uh, you will find out from there about uh, future events. Uh, follow Nicola, follow myself. Actually, actually, we kind of did not uh, say in the beginning that these tech talks, it's a chain, it's a series of talks. So uh, there is, I don't know it how uh, often, but let's say in some couple of three, four months, uh, there are such uh, session on different topics, of course, different people are presenting. Uh, but again, check our Facebook pages and LinkedIn pages every day and you'll see. We have an Instagram page as well, so yeah. Okay, more dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> have everything and yes Nicola and Kathleen said uh, stay tuned for for the next event bye everyone bye bye, bye, bye. bye. For, uh, for the questions for everything I hope you had a great time bye have Thanks. a great night bye 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 bye